Okay, so now let's let's take a look at a few examples. And the first example is going to be some analysis that was done with a power flow on an actual utility circuit. And let me get this where I can use the pen. So this is a baseline a utility 12 kV circuit. And it had a peak load of 6.7 megawatts and the length of the main feeder was three miles. And so the substation is actually here at the bottom. And so you can kind of see there's a main feeder, but a bunch of lateral taps off of this. And we're using what's sometimes referred to as a kind of like a heat map type of diagram where we have different colors associated with the voltage. And so red would correspond to the higher voltages and then blue to purple would be for the lower voltages. And you can kind of see on the circuit that uh, in this particular case that we have the issues kind of with low voltage. And so from a high, you go from a high 124 volts to a low 117, the losses are 170 kilowatts. Um, the top of the feeder, we actually get 6.8 megawatts because we have to compensate for the losses. And so the, the top of feeder power is a little bit greater than the net load because of that. And so this would be what we refer to as the base case. And this is the base case without having distributed generation on the circuit. Now, what we could do is we could start to look at putting PV on here. And in this case, we were looking at putting out residential PV, kind of distribute this out in the feeder level. And what we're assuming is 100%, we call 100% penetration. And so if we have a load peak, then we, we typically gauge the amount of PV as a percentage of the load peak. And so in this case, we had a match where we had our peak PV generation match up with our load peak. In this case, we were putting about 300 individual units out in this feeder. And what you would see in this case, if you looked at this at a load peak sort of condition, that this really has pretty good results. I mean, basically the voltages are within a pretty decent range between 122.8 and 124.5 volts. The losses drop way down. And basically, we don't really have to supply very much power from the grid. And so this is kind of a net zero type of an example right here. But the, the issue you run into is what is going to happen when you, you're at light loading conditions, right? And so um, this is where you have kind of like your PV match with the load and you get good results as a result of something like this. But then if you're looking at a light loading condition, let's suppose this is 40% of peak load and your load's only 2.8. Well, then if you look at the base case for this light loading condition, we don't get that much of a deviation in voltage. We're only going from 121.5 to 124.3. And then the losses drop back down. The thing you run into is if you take this light loading condition and you superimpose on it a peak PV. Now, when is something like this likely to happen? Well, likely time for this to happen would be in the spring conditions or fall conditions. Spring conditions and fall conditions, you might not have much air conditioning load or you may not have much heating load. And so what happens if you have light load around midday when the PV is at its peak, then basically what you're doing now is you're back feeding into the grid. You're basically pushing 3.9 megawatts back into the grid. And you see what happens is now the voltage range goes from 123.9 up to 126.7. And so you're, you're starting to see more toward the ends of the feeder. You're starting to see over voltage now. And so this is what's associated with the back feed. We see a little bit of increase in losses. It's not so bad. But the thing that concerns us is we have over voltage and we're basically losing effective voltage control. So anyway, um, when we run these sorts of studies, this is sort of the stuff we look at. And if I were having you run a, like an integration or interconnection study, I'd have you run this for a number of different cases. You know, not only the peak condition cases now like we used to run, but we have to look at these light load conditions as well to make sure that when we're 
pushing power net into the opposite direction in the transmission that we don't have issues like this. Now here's kind of more of a numerical example here, and this will be kind of similar to what I'm going to give you guys in homework eight. And so what you have is you have a 12.47 kV feeder, and this shows the nature of the feeder. And so we have a voltage regulated bus at the top. We've got loads on the circuit. And what we're looking at, we're looking at putting a PV facility at location number two. We're going to use K-factor analysis for looking at this particular circuit right here. And so we're regulating the top of feeder to 1.04. I've got 336 conductor for the circuit for the backbone that has these resistances and reactances per mile. Uh, and then what I've got is I've got the top of the feeder regulated to 1.04. So we'll look at a base case with no PV in the circuit. And what we want to do is we want to calculate the voltage bus magnitude at one, two, and three. Now, we may not know at what time of day the worst condition is, right? And so when you're doing this sort of analysis, what you typically would do now is you'd work with a daily load profile in a daily PV profile. And so in this case, this is what the load looks like. The load kind of drops down, kind of flattens out during the day, and then it comes back up in the evening time. And then the PV is going to be having a characteristic kind of sinusoidal in nature, where it starts to pick up when the sun comes up in the morning and drops off during the evening hours. And so what we have is a function of time. I've got an hourly resolution on this is we'd have the load output and we'd have the PV output. And you'll note in this case that the load output is maximized at 7 p.m. at 1900 hours. And so what we do in this case, if I wanna analyze this circuit, I would have to do kind of like a load allocation strategy, the four, two, and the one, which totals up to 7,000. This is peak. But if I had a lower loading condition, what I would do is I would ratio out that measured net value according to the size of the loads of these different buses. And so I, I'm kind of running a, a simplistic load allocation to, in order to do this. So when you're doing this particular type of analysis right here, what you can do is you can set this up in terms of K factors. And so if we're running at a power factor of 0.9 for our load, I need to have a K factor that corresponds to this 336 resistance and reactance. I, I'm going to get a K factor. I'll do this in percent voltage drop per kVA mile. And then with no PV in the circuit, I'll calculate the voltage drop across each segment, right? So these are going to be the percent voltage drops. Then what I could do is I can then calculate the voltages of these three buses. And this is something you guys have done before. And you could do these in um, percent, or I could do these in per unit. What I'm actually kind of doing in this case is the calculations are per, in percent. Um, but what I'm doing here at the very, very end is I'm converting this into per unit right here by dividing it by 100. So this is what we have under peak. And you see we're going between 1.015 per unit and 0.992 per unit. So we're in pretty good shape in this case as far as the voltage profile. If I look under the light loading condition, the light loading condition in this case turns out to be at 3 o'clock in the morning. And so you would take the 3214, and what you do at each of the loads is you'd use a ratio. So this load right here would be the 3214 divided by 7,000. And I would ratio that out according to the size of the peak load. And so you do these same calculations and you could do these um, at different times. I'm gonna do this at three o'clock in this case because that's what the light load condition is. And you get the percent voltage drop, then you can see that these percent voltage drops are quite a bit less, right? And so then when you're going to look at the, the voltages in this case, the voltages all swing higher then, right? And so 
for the base case, you look at the circuit, you look at the peak conditions, you look under light load conditions, and you see, you know, what's kind of going on with the voltages right here, uh, as far as the deviation in voltage and what you kind of expect to see under the light load conditions, you expect to see the voltages a little bit higher, right? So normally, normally if I'm doing studies and I'm running power flow programs, I, I usually focus on my peaks because that's usually when I have the worst case conditions as far as low voltages and capacity limits. But when we're talking about DER integration, um, that's not going to be the worst case all the time. It, a lot of times it's light load conditions because if I have more PV than load, that causes the over voltages. And so this would be another case that you have to run is you have to run the light load cases. So if I set up a spreadsheet for this and just to kind of uh, not have to do the tedious calculation for each load point, then what you can do is you can, you'd have the, the net load KVA, you can calculate the various voltage drops, you can calculate the bus voltages in this case. And you could see that as far as the voltages, um, you'd have situations where under your lows for your load load, you get the highest voltage. And then when you look at your peak load, this is when you would get the, the lower voltages on the circuit. And then usually the lower lowest voltage is at the end of the feeder. Now, what if we start looking at PV penetration? How are we going to do this? Very similar to the way we had done the uh, voltage boost due to capacitors, we're going to have a K factor for PV. Now, what's going to be different in this case? Well, for PV, a lot of times we're operating at unity power factor. And so the sine theta term is going to be zero. The cosine of theta term is going to be one. And what the KPV term is going to basically sh um, be based on is what's the interaction between the line resistance and the, and the unity power factor load, right? And basically now what we're going to have is when we apply the K factor, it's a negative load, right? So if you had 5,000 kilowatts, it would be minus 5,000 kilowatt net load, right? And so what this means, we get a voltage boost instead of a voltage drop. So if I have this sort of setup where PV is at bus number two, then the current associated with the PV goes for, from section zero one to one two. It's not gonna cause a voltage boost across section two three, although the load at three is gonna see the impact, but it only sees it due to the rise in voltage on section zero, one, or one, two. So when you look at the, the voltage change, then you've got one mile from zero to one, you got 1 1.5 miles from one to two. You would then plug in the value for the PV. And since this is linear, what we can do in this case is we basically can just simply uh, superimpose now the impact of the PV. So if I had my original loading condition, I don't have to do anything from scratch. I could just add to it the change that's due to the rise that's caused by having the PV system in the circuit. So if I put this now in terms of a spreadsheet and uh, I've got this PV installation now being modeled, then what I can do is I can see what's gonna be happening with my, my voltages in the circuit. And because of the PV, what happens is we now see some higher voltages and where these higher voltages are, are mostly noticeable is at midday at the location where the PV is actually at. Typically the point of common coupling between the PV and the grid is where you have the highest voltage rise. Uh, and so anyway, uh, in this kind of like a heat map sort of a diagram, you can see we still have over voltages just due to light load conditions. Um, but now we're going to see these over voltages in the, in the middle of the day. And if we had more PV in the circuit, then these over voltages would even be higher.
What's sort of interesting about this as well, when you're looking at maximum and minimum voltages at each bus, is the worst case voltages for each bus are not necessarily at the same time anymore. And so the worst case high voltage for buses one and three is at 3 a.m. in the morning, whereas the worst case voltage at bus number two is going to be at 11 o'clock in the morning, kind of associated with the high PV output. One other thing we could do when we're adding PV into the circuit is we, we know we're going to get a voltage rise, right? So how would we counteract this, right? So if I have a line element and I've got a real load in this case, that's kind of like a minus P, how do I counteract the voltage rise that's caused by this? Well, what I could actually do in this case is I can have this bus load right here, which is the PV site, actually absorb reactive power, just like a load. And so what this means is this, this particular PV device is actually going to be operating a leading power factor. Um, so we're basically injecting P, but we're actually absorbing Q, all right? And in this case, we're doing this at 0.9 power factor leading. So now I have the sine term and this angle um, is actually gonna be like negative in this case. And when I take the arc cosine of 0.9, I plug this into the sine, we, we get a minus right here, which, which indicates that what's kind of going on in this case is this is uh, um, acting as a, as a Q load in this case. And so I'm still putting in the um, minus SPV, but now what I'm gonna get is a voltage boost due to the P and a voltage drop due to the Q, okay? And so this is, this is why it's kind of useful to be able to have VAR control on the PV facility because it helps us regulate the voltage. So now when I do this calculation at the 0.9 leading power factor, then what I'm going to see is at the middle of the day now where I had this high voltage before, now it's gone. All right, I, I've been able to kind of cancel that out, that effect out through this, this reactive power control. Now, thing you got to realize about this reactive power control is now you may have you may have scenarios right here where because of the Q flow then you might actually start having some other impacts on the circuit you know in terms of voltage changes like somewhere else or changes in losses somewhere else right so there's always going to be issues with this because this reactive power that's absorbed by the PV facility has to come from somewhere. Maybe it comes from local capacitors or maybe it comes from transmission. Um, but realize that there's going to be side effects to something like this. All right, so the last part of this, there's a question that, that asks you, assuming when it maintain the bus voltages below 1.04 per unit, what's the maximum size of take system in KW operating at unity power factor, we could add a bus two if we need to meet this upper voltage constraint. And what we're doing here is what's sometimes called a hosting capacity calculation. We're trying to figure out the maximum PV we could actually fit into the circuit. And so for this last part, then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the time where PV is at its maximum output. So that's going to be at 12 o'clock. Um, we're going to then use the K factor approach and we're going to make use of the voltage drop due to the PV. But what, now what we're going to do is we're going to write this in terms of SPV and then we're going to set V2 equal to 1.04 and we're going to solve for the value of SPV needed. Kind of similar to before when we were looking at how much capacitance we needed to add 
to get the voltage at bus at a certain uh, level. And when we solve this, what we can see is we could actually have up to 6,683 6, kVA um, and, and still um, keep that voltage below 1.04. But as I mentioned before, this is what kind of limits us to how much PV we can integrate into a circuit is if we don't have any of this sort of regulation control, we may have to put a cap on the amount of PV to keep the voltage from going too high. So anyway, you can kind of redo the heat maps in this case, and you can kind of verify that, you know, we had calculated the right um, value um, because, you know, we're showing here, this gets up to like 1.04 for the peak voltage. Uh, if you want some other references on this, there's some material in Tom Short's book on, on DG. He kind of talks about some of the other impact issues. And what's a real useful reference, it's getting a little dated, um, but it's still a pretty good reference, is this National Renewable Energy Lab Handbook on PV Integration. It has, it has a lot of good material in there about things to look at doing an interconnection study, the different things I talked about in this lecture. Another good reference is a, a report that was co-written by NREL and Southern California Edison. And this is in the early days of PV interconnection studies, where basically it gives some examples in working on natural circuits. So it's, it's a little old, but basically Southern California Edison had some of the first circuits that were operating at high impact, high penetration levels. And they actually go through and show how they actually did the studies. And I think that's, it's pretty insightful actually. It, you know, it, it kind of shows, you know, what they were concerned about and how they actually organize the analysis then. Okay, so um, if you want some other references, here's some other sites you might want to look at. Uh, probably is not as useful for doing interconnection studies, but it's just some other sites if you're just kind of interested in PV in general. So SunSpec and, um, Alliance works on a lot of standards around photovoltaic, uh, especially on communication standards like using Modbus and 61850 and stuff like that. Uh, there's a trade organization called SEIA. They usually have a, a lot of good material about how many plants are being installed per year in the United States and things like that. There's Interconnection Renewable Energy Council. They, they do a lot of independent work on study guidelines that, that are used by different um, engineers doing these studies. And then there's a tool called Desire. It's, it's a database that tracks you know, what are all the different state rules and regulations on renewables. This is something that's put together by the North Carolina Clean Tech Center at North Carolina State University. So this is a pretty useful database if you want to see the latest on, you know, what the procedures are for interconnecting renewables and distributed generation at different utilities in the U.S. Okay, so um, what we'll do in the, the next lecture, I'll get into more detail on, on DER, specifically with respect to what the standards allow us to do, and then um, talk about how we can mitigate or solve some of these issues we kind of saw in this lecture on the impacts.